The Parable, a story told to illustrate an abstract idea, an effort to focus on a universal theme through a concrete particular event, to move from what F.H. Bradley, Eliot's mentor, called the parade of bloodless categories to the full-bodied reality of experience. This is the core of Eliot's poetry, shot through and through with the metaphysical ideas of Bradley. The poet and the philosopher shared a radical skepticism, a despair that what passes for human knowledge is really anything but deceptive illusions. They saw the history of human thought and culture as a continuous flight away from reality in the vain belief that the pigeonholes of words can make us the masters of our experience. Through the vividness and concreteness of images and parable, both philosopher and poet attempt to reimmerse themselves in the stream of experience, which when shared by all is reality itself, a stream that can liberate the spirit from the restrictive limitations of intellectual analysis. As Eliot describes it in his four quartets, from wrong to wrong, the exasperated spirit proceeds unless restored by that refining fire where you must move in measure like a dancer. In the spirit of these lines, our multimedia program today is an attempt to extend Eliot's parables beyond the medium of words in which he expressed them and into the media of music, painting, cinema, and dance in order to extend the poetic insight like ever-widening ripples on a lake. In so doing, we depart farther and farther from the precision of language until the stream of auditory and visual images loses all established meaning and becomes a pure experience yet retains the feelings and the themes of the poetic ideas. The different art forms, musical, cinematic, graphic, and choreographic, as well as poetic, provide complementary expressions of a fundamental vision that cannot be stated in words alone, but can only be suggested by the original poems. The different expressions of the themes in different media are not intended as simultaneous translations like a United Nations meeting, but as parts of a totality of experience inspired by Eliot's poetry. Our program will, therefore, provide us with a stream of images as either a poem or a part of a poem is read, while the camera's eye ranges over a painting suggested by the poem. This will be followed by a dance choreographed in such a way as to focus on a central theme in the poem. In Marina, the theme is the transcendence of death. In Ash Wednesday, it is the stormy relation between the sensual and the spiritual. In Portrait of a Lady, the tension between friendship and love. And in the Four Quartets, the blending of the individual self in the all-embracing totality of shared experience. Eliot is just the right poet to treat in this multimedia way because he shared the conviction of Francis Bradley that no representation of reality can do it complete justice, so that combining different representations of the same vision in different art forms may bring us closer to the ineffable truth. What seas, what shores, what gray rocks, and what islands, what water lapping the bough and scent of pine, and the wood thrush singing through the fog, what images return, O oh, my daughter? Those who sharpen the tooth of the dog, 
meaning death. Those who glitter with the glory of the hummingbird, meaning death. Those who sit in the sty of contentment, meaning death. Those who suffer the ecstasy of the animals, meaning death are become unsubstantial, reduced by a wind, a breath of pine, and the wind song fog by this grace dissolved in place. What is this face, less clear and clearer, the pulse in the arm, less strong and stronger, given or lent, more distant than the stars, and nearer than the eye, whispers, and small laughter between leaves and hurrying feet, under sleep, where all the waters meet. Bowsprit cracked with ice, and paint cracked with heat, I made this, I have forgotten and remember the rigging weak and the canvas rotten between one June and another September made this unknowing, half conscious, unknown, my own. The garbered straight leaks, the seams need caulking, this form, this face, this life living to live in a world of time beyond me. Let me resign my life for this life, my speech for that unspoken, the awakened, lips parted, the hope, the new ships. What seas, what shores, what granite islands toward my timbers and wood thrush calling through the fog my daughter
Lady, three white leopards sat under a juniper tree in the cool of the day, having fed to satiety. On my legs, my heart, my liver, and that which had been contained in the hollow round of my skull. And God said, Shall these bones live? Shall these bones live? And that which had been contained in the bones which were already dry, said, chirping, Because of the goodness of this lady, and because of her loveliness, and because she honors the Virgin in meditation, we shine with brightness. And I, who am here dissembled, proffer my deeds to oblivion, and my love to the posterity of the desert and the fruit of the gourd. It is this which recovers my guts, the strings of my eyes, and the indigestible portions which the leopards reject. The lady is withdrawn in a white gown to contemplation in a white gown. Let the whiteness of bones atone to forgetfulness. There is no life in them. As I am forgotten and would be forgotten, so I would forget, thus devoted, concentrated in purpose. And God said, prophecy to the wind, to the wind only, for only the wind will listen. And the bones sang, chirping, with the burden of the grasshopper, saying, Lady of silences, calm and distress, torn and most whole, rose of memory, rose of forgetfulness, exhausted and life-giving, worried, reposeful, the single rose is now the garden where all loves end, terminate torment of love unsatisfied, the greater torment of love satisfied, end of the endless journey to no end, conclusion of all that is inconclusible, speech without word, and word of no speech, grace to the mother for the garden where all love ends. Under a juniper tree the bones sang, scattered and shining. We are glad to be scattered. We did little good to each other. Under a tree in the cool of the day, with the blessing of sand, forgetting themselves and each other, united in the quiet of the desert. This is the land which she shall divide by lot. And neither division nor unity matters. This is the land we have our inheritance.
You do not know how much they mean to me, my friends, and how, how rare and strange it is to find in a life composed so much, so much of odds and ends, for indeed I do not love it, you knew you are not blind, how keen you are to find a friend who has these qualities, who has and gives those qualities upon which friendship lives. How much it means that I say this to you. Without these friendships, life, what koshima? Now that lilacs are in bloom, she has a bowl of lilacs in her room, and twist one in her fingers while she talks. Ah, my friend, you do not know, you do not know what life is. You who hold it in your hands, slowly twisting the lilac stalks, you let it flow from you, you let it flow. And youth is cruel and has no remorse and smiles at situations which it cannot see. I smile, of course, and go on drinking tea. Yet with these April sunsets that somehow recall my buried life and Paris in the spring, I feel immeasurably at peace and find the world to be wonderful and youthful after all. For everybody said so, all my friends, they were all sure our feelings would relate so closely. I myself can hardly understand. We must leave it now to fate. You will write, at any rate. Perhaps it is not too late. I shall sit here serving tea to friends. Well, and what if she should die some afternoon, afternoon gray and smoky, evening yellow and rose, should die and leave me sitting pen in hand with the smoke coming down above the housetops, doubtful for a while, not knowing what to feel, if I understand, or whether wise or foolish, tardy or too soon, would she not have the advantage after all? This music is successful with a dying fall. Now that we talk of dying, and should I have the right to smile?
As body and soul begin to fall asunder, second, the conscious impotence of rage at human folly and the laceration of laughter at what ceases to amuse. And last, the rending pain of reenactment of all that you have done and been, the shame of motives late revealed, and the awareness of things ill done and done to others harm which once you took for exercise of virtue. Then fool's approval stings and honor stains. From wrong to wrong the exasperated spirit proceeds, unless restored by that refining fire where you must move in measure like a dancer. The day was breaking. In the disfigured street he left me with a kind of valediction and faded on the blowing of the horn. The only hope or else despair lies in the choice of pyre or pyre to be redeemed from fire by fire. Who then devised the torment? Love. Love is the unfamiliar name. Behind the hands that wove the intolerable shirt of flame which human power cannot remove. We only live, only suspire, consumed by either fire or fire. We shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Through the unknown, remembered gate, when the last of earth left to discover is that which was the beginning, at the source of the longest river, the voice of the hidden waterfall, and the children in the apple tree, not known because not looked for, but heard, half heard, in the stillness between two waves of the sea. Quick now, here, now, always. A condition of complete simplicity, costing no less than everything. And all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, when the tongues of flame are infolded into the crowned knot of fire, and the fire and the rose are one.